Hello, uh, my name is Jim Porter, and this is the channel Skeptical Spectrum, uh, where I try to discuss the hottest topics available, meaning the most provocative topics. <coughs> topics. Um, and I don't know what I'm going to call this series. I could call it Change Jim Porter's Minds, or we could call it Getting Serious, um, or we could call it, I don't know. But all I know is that I have a guest here, and this is Karen Porter. Hello. Uh, and uh, Karen Porter has, uh, I mean, is there any, we don't need to have any kind of qualifications to be able to have these kind of discussions, right? We're citizens no. of the United States, and that's one. I'm a person that happens to be married to you. Yeah, I'm a person that happens to be married to you. So we have that person thing in common, except yeah. that we're married to different people. That's, that's kind of where a lot of our conflict comes up. I'm married to her, she's married to me. And then so, you know, we chose different people to marry her. It worked out pretty well. It worked out pretty well, yeah. But we like, I, I like controversy because I think controversy is a way of keeping myself from being stuck in beliefs that I've just uh, adopted and assumed without questioning them. So hopefully we may agree on all of this or we may disagree on all this, but it doesn't matter. What matters is we pump out our thoughts and maybe it'll add to the public discussion. So. Uh, what was the topic you chose for today, Karen Porter? Global warming. Global warming. Let me close the door for a second. All right. Yeah. The door is going to be closed for a second, probably longer than a second. Okay. Uh, and a lot of people use the term climate change, but we do know that it's getting hotter this summer. So why is that an important topic to you? I think it supersedes all other problems that we have in our world because I think it's going to cause um, massive um, food shortages. Mm. It's going to cause flooding. Okay. Um, it's going to cause saltwater intrusion. It's going to cause transportation issues. It Already in Kentucky, we have flooding there where Whole roads, whole towns have been just totally washed away. Okay. And there's going to be climate refugees. And, you know, I we argued about this constantly with my students when I had a school. And they said, oh, well, I don't, we don't know if it's man-made or not. Mm -hmm. And I think that tends to be the biggest argument. And I, I, don't, I would always come back at them and say, you know, it doesn't really matter whether it's man-made or not. We need to prepare for it. And I think the, and I, it does matter because the coal produces carbon emissions, which creates um, massive carbon being produced that, that creates a kind of a blanket around the earth that locks the greenhouse gases in, which raises the temperature. And this has been going on for generations. It's not just, you know, recent. So we might have been talk of it in the '60s, maybe the '50s. I don't know, but definitely even starting in the '60s. You know, and I, I really think I went back to my great 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 grandfather's farm mm -hmm. in Radnor, Ohio, and I looked at the soil, and I had been reading the um, his will. And he had cut so many trees along the Scioto River. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now you look at the soil and it's all the good stuff is washed away because the trees were was holding in the good quality soil. And and that was 1803. Yeah. yeah. So that's how many? 223 years. So even if not global, we know that we can we we have for a long time been able to affect large parts of the earth in ways that are permanent. Or yeah, large. I mean, I guess you and I aren't very good people to argue about the different sides to this because I think both of us agree. Maybe. Yeah. No, I'm not even sure if we're here to argue about it. Okay. Um, I'm here to get the topic out. Um, one of the things that I do think is that it does become important to consider whether or not humans have caused it because that not exactly directly but it does suggest that humans can act in ways that are better for the stability of the climate 
or worse for the stability, which means if we come up with ways to stop doing the wrong things and better things to do, perhaps we can mitigate the potential effects of climate change. And, and it is the case that if we stuck, I mean, I believe it's the case that if we stuck to some agreements like Paris Accords and stuff like that, we might be in a better situation if we found solutions and started to put them in place and stop doing, you know what I mean? So the fact but what I really have a problem with is just in the past two years or three years, I have seen trees being in just in Gainesville and Newberry mm -hmm. alone just being chopped down and pavement being put in place and all that good soil you can see it being bulldozed into a pile I don't know what they do with it mm -hmm. but you know and then they're covering it with cement and you can go and walk in celebration station or whatever that is you can go walk on that area and i would be willing to wager you you could take a thermometer oh yeah and you could see that it's probably 10 or 15 degrees hotter mm -hmm. in that parking lot than it would be underneath the shade of a tree yes and you might be able to like take our zip code in the alachua county florida um and type it into google and see what the temperatures and expected temperatures are for the day and then type something in the center of Gainesville, Florida, and see what the temperatures are expected, you know. And also, um, there are people who do that and record years and years of that data and then average it out. And it does show that more, um, um, what are they called, urbanized, built up areas have hotter, hotter temperatures because- our And why are they doing this? You know, they should know better, but it's all about profit. All they care about is the immediate future and their pocketbook in the next five, 10 years. They don't care about their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And neither does Joe Manchin. He's getting all these deals to excavate coal and sell it in West Virginia. And here we are, you know, there's massive flooding in his state. And he doesn't care. He cares about his own pocketbook today. He doesn't even care about his own grandchildren probably could agree with you on that. I can't read the man's mind, but apparently he's not acting um, in their favor. Now, he may think he's acting in their favor because he may think, as some of us do, that the most wealthy, powerful people will be able to skirt the worst effects and benefit from being able to purchase whatever they need to to not experience the bad effects of climate change. And so maybe he wants to make billions of dollars so he can pass it on to his kids so that they can sit in a comfortable condo while the while the, while the earth burns down, you know. So yeah. there's, there's a chance that he's actually acting stupidly, but that he believes he's behaving strategically, strategically for the benefit of his children and grandchildren. Yeah, he doesn't think that we're connected. He doesn't care about the average person, in my opinion. Yeah, he doesn't seem to act like that, he, like yeah. me, you know. And you get all these moguls who want, they think progress is building new houses and cutting down more trees and building more um, sites to, to dig deep into the earth and get oil <laughs> and fossil fuels. And we could be engineering new ways to get new, in, new energy sources that wouldn't destroy the earth wouldn't pollute the planet and and people have chosen to spend their whole lives digging down into the earth and exposing the the minerals because they think oh well there's more where that came from you know there's something that you that you bring up uh typically in a conference you're very economically minded and very financially minded which i consider two slightly different things um but what do you think some of the ep economic uh, problems are with how we deal with co climate change? I mean, do you think that they tie in together in some way? Yes, I think it's, you know, I look at my own pocketbook and my own microeconomic life, and you can compare it to macroeconomics. You know, the earth has finite resources, and so does my bank account. If I went, 
Sorry, it's true. <laughs> but if we went and we spent every last penny we had, or we we spent more mm -hmm. than we could mm -hmm. afford mm -hmm. for our life, you know, we would end up with nothing. And then what? We'd be in the poorhouse at age 75. Do you think that the people that make the bigger choices, the policies, who have the ability to purchase the largest things, big plots of land, resources, um, diamond mines, um, apparently they can get permission to carve right through people's farms if they want to put a pipeline. People that have that kind of power and wealth, do you think they actually have the, the some problem that makes them choose the wrong way? Like they may not be able to understand a global global warming. B, they may not understand the economics of the earth in general. They might not understand how people are doing across the world. Um, do you think that there is something about the wealthy people that makes it so that they're innocently doing all these horrible things? Or do you feel like, no, some of them know full well that they're gonna cause a lot of harm and they're just hoping to get what's good for them right away? I think our society is founded on capital okay. and capitalism. Capital and to me is the ability to control enough resources to be able to um, employ people. Is that what capital is? What is yeah, capital? it's like it's based on ownership. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's and enough to own your own stuff and maybe enough to own your own business. And the more you own, the more power you have. And nothing is looked, at, they don't look at um, wisdom or the group. So there are times we've been taught incorrectly, I believe, that capitalism is, ha has a healthy marriage with democracy. Okay. And, and you're saying it's not. I think it's more closely related connected to fascism because Defining fascism in some way what what's uh unbridled control that. over resources by a select few okay okay it's authoritarian okay so that's okay now that does act that actually sounds like a lot of the definitions that i've heard yeah uh, a lot of times the government is part of what gives the those with the most capital more power and colloquially, everybody thinks that the corporations are running the government and it's a corporatocracy and all that stuff. Or a lot of people talk that way. Um, so I, I guess I'm hearing a nexus between capital and government or capital and power as people's definition of fascism. Yeah, but it doesn't always have to be bad. It can be good. You know, I, I think Franklin Delano Roosevelt came from a very moneyed family. and understood what needed to be done to bring our country out of the depression. Yeah, so how does how does someone get that kind of perspective? That And how does someone m miss out on that kind of perspective? How could somebody that's a very wealthy landed person, how could one person understand, we can't keep doing what we're doing, we need to do some very things that sound very sort of liberal, I mean, in his policies, right? At that time, they were probably so necessary, nobody cared. But how does how does someone get that frame of mind in their head if they're very wealthy and perhaps protected from the worst effects? And how come some don't get the, that awareness in their head that they need to do something different? I don't know. Maybe <laughs> it's just their personality and their soul and what they care what you know being compassionate mm -hmm. human beings and not caring and i think you know i got my stomach did a turn one day when i was teaching a class and i was trying to build a community out of paper these little paper patterns of houses and we built some grocery stores and farms and things like that and everyone was supposed to figure out how to work together to build a community. And one of the kids <laughs> said, I'm going to build a compound. I don't know if he was just trying to tease me. 
<laughs> but he said, I'm going to build a compound, put a wall around, and then go out of my compound to get, when, when resources are finite, I will just come out of my compound with my guns because I will arm myself and then I'll go steal the resources I need and bring them back to my compound. Ooh. Wow. And, you know, there are people that think like that. They don't think about where are you, who's going to grow those tomatoes that you want to eat or the wheat that you want to grow. I mean, look at Putin right now. He doesn't care about the fact that people are dying, are going to, there's food insecurity and there's going to be famine because he's not letting grain go out of the, out of um, Ukraine. Do you he's think stopping there's, grain shipments. I know there's a nexus between power and, and elite um, and our conversation in terms of Putin. Do you feel like there's a connection between uh, Putin, people like Putin, you know, people in those positions, and climate change. Do you think Putin's affecting climate change? Uh, I mean, the, do these do these come together at all? The the war uh, in Ukraine and climate change. I I suppose war has always brought up the temperature of the planet. I mean, even during World War Two, my father talked about when he was a kid he was he saw the aurora borealis in ohio oh you're not supposed to be able to see it in ohio no oh why is that because the atmosphere was thin yeah or something and like that? i think that the yeah atomic bomb had gone off and it changed the whole the whole schmear uh, yeah Okay. So, you know, think about all the, the weapons that they're discharging. Mm hmm Constant. The things well, they're burning. Yeah, it's more... The resources they're ruining. It's just... It's disgusting. very... It's the disregard for all the, the energy that went into building the buildings they have. And then now they're going to have to rebuild. And that's going to take resources and burn carbon. So I'm going to bring it around to sort of um, individuals in societies, I guess, um, starting with probably the United States and then maybe just globally, because I, I think I've heard of effects, but I want to know your opinion or your knowledge on it. Um, just climate change in general, what's going on? The temperatures are changing. These other things are happening. How does that affect individuals in different regions of the United States or in different economic levels in the United States, in your opinion, whatever you think is most important. Or, or well, you know, um, it's so interesting how they say climate refugees are usually the people of lower income. And you look at the people who died in Kentucky or the people that lost everything they had, they didn't have very much before that. They were just cobbling a life together and living on the margin in floodplains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the so, way, is, there, is that an automatic economic thing that people are probably gonna be able to find homes in the floodplains if they're economically disadvantaged versus um, they're not empowered financially to go find other places to live? Like, is it possibly the case that some of the best, um, what do you call it, prime real estate to purchase is far away from all these hazards? Yeah. I, I mean, you look at any town that I've lived in, in my whole life, the the, the um, wealthy people were on the north side of town. River, the river flew, wow. flowed north to south. Mm -hmm. Wealthy mm -hmm. people were on the north side of town and the poor people were on the south side. And we live in Florida. <laughs> yeah and so all that well now but our river is different because yeah, it goes I, east to west except we have a little conflict with georgia or we have had in the past um, Do I, wait does does the saint john's river flow east to west or west to east um well it also goes north to south um oh. but i think 
I don't know if it flows east to west, but I okay. do want to take a trip down it and we'll find out. Yeah. So, yeah. So what, what happens is the people, the poor people get the dregs, they get the polluted, you know, people have their outhouses and their, they send it flows downstream and the poor people have to deal with that. And I would say that um, a concern during the argument with, between Georgia and Florida was that we would have less left over to flow into our rivers. Um, yeah. So th they didn't think of it as one river. They thought of it as, this is, our, Georgia was saying, this is our river. It's not your river. Your river's down there. As if there were two rivers. As if like, I could argue over which portion of this arm belongs to my head and which portion of this arm belongs to my fingers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's one arm, it's one river. Um, but you're saying that it does tend to be the wealthy that live further north. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, and that can work cyclically because if you have the better resources, you have resources to, resources to become more wealthy too. Oh, you know, I just looked it up. The St. John's River flows north. Okay. Then we're going to have to do some hard paddling. But most, Stanford. I thought most rivers flow south. Most rivers do flow south. Just a few don't. Okay. So that would be, okay. Yeah. So, the um, exception. so you're saying that's at least one reason why um, people with fewer means are going to tend to suffer more from climate change. Than yeah. From better means. Um, from high, yeah, from more wealthy means. Um, and uh, yeah, that the reason I'm asking that is because I want to have this be a personal issue. If people are going to care about it, I wouldn't want to make up reasons for them to care about it. I want them to have real bona fide personal interest as to why climate change might really hurt them and that sort of thing. You know? Yeah, and I think um, people need to start looking in their lives at how they can make positive social change. But I remember Brenda Bain, a friend of ours, once said to me, her goal in life was to plant one tree for every year of her life. And I think that is a really positive goal because when you look, when you think about if you just, if everyone did that, we would be forested in this country. We would have so many trees. We would have so many, you know, it would be a wonderful thing. That brings up a question of how do, how do people get millions or billions of people to do an action? <laughs> I thought you well, were... I think it's little chipping at a way like we've done. Uh, do you think government is a way to do it? By the way, I do. Yes. Bring it up, you know. Um, that I bring up government because it's kind of a weird, controversial subject. We think of the government sometimes as this overbearing thing on top of us that doesn't know how to do anything but push pencils, and then when we're on the Fourth of July, we say we have this amazing government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It is a force that enacts our will, yippee, and we, we, we do some beer drinking and we do some barbecue, and we throw up some fireworks. Um, and our dogs go like this, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But, but the point is um, that how do, how do you, because this is a big deal when people say, if everybody could just blank, or if everybody, how do we get people acting in a unified way? Um, I think the answer <coughs> to start modeling it. You think modeling will do it? Mm. You think like just doing it will get other people to do it? Yeah. <coughs> How come? Because Well, I think that plastics thing we saw in the PBS. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you look at the problem and if you teach everybody that it is a problem mm -hmm. then and get people involved then they <clears throat> understand it and it can't be solved until people understand it so that's the first step so people watching the problem being made aware of the problem as uh, whilst because they are simultaneously watching someone try to do same thing about the problem might 
give them the awareness and maybe even the stimulation to to want to do something about it maybe even enough motivation to get up and try some action yeah and the thing we saw yesterday there was a a a, a, a brief dialectic between two people one that thought we needed to do it through policy um worldwide policy and the other one that thought i need to be out here doing this in front of people and getting people to help me and yeah, yeah why do you what, do you think both were true and why do you think one's more true than the other or, or what? one's showing the example i think you know yes yeah, an engineer who has the exciting um intelligent mechanism for solving the problem practically and can do it is one thing but unless you get everybody on board all hands on deck because we are sharing this planet with everybody you're not going to convince everyone to fund it you're not going to convince people to actually do what needs to be done okay say that again I, I, you got the all hands on board yeah and so not everybody has the same expertise as an engineer I see, I see. I see. But everybody has uh, the same, that we're all human with the heart and we all have a, a an interest in surviving. And so if we get educated as, as the human race, that this is a problem. And if people start modeling it, then okay. they will. Um, so why, this is like, I guess the last question. Why do you think people are or are not learning it and, and putting it into action? What you I think when you have a chance at making a couple billion dollars, sometimes you have a self-fulfilling narrative that you create in order to justify what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really easy when somebody's working for the Colorado School of Mines to justify, oh, well, it's not really going to hurt that many people. We do this all over the world. We've been doing it for hundreds of years. And look, nobody died yet. You know, yeah, it's easy um, to not listen to the science. That's true. It's uh, Mark Twain said something like that. If it's hard to convince somebody of something. Um, it's 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 hard to disabuse someone of a belief um that their income relies on you know like <laughs> that kind of thing so self-interest can conflict with long-term self-interest yeah and, and with and brought with broader human interest yeah and so i think if the voters manage to like the little people all understand that these this is a problem maybe they'll vote for politicians who will put money into like things that bring more money to the renewable energy and to um you know putting houses on stilts in floodplains all right so that will be my last uh, question that i had asked before and your word that you just made will be the last except um what would you like the audience to know about you or any website or youtube channel that you'd like them to go to or any you know, since I, since you're on my channel and somebody, there might be one or two people that watch this video. So, okay. Well, I have a blog like, called yeah. the Emotitude blog and I have a podcast called the Dealing with Feeling podcast. And I also have a YouTube channel called Dealing with Feeling. All right. And anybody watching this should know that I have a channel called S Skeptical Spectrum because that would be the channel that you're watching if you're seeing this. Uh, all right. Take care of yourself. And um, I'm going to try to visit you today by walking to the other side of the house and saying hi. Okay. Right. Thanks Bye. for going through the trouble of being on the show. Thank you. Bye.